Alright, good day everyone and welcome to a guide for Terra Invicta, specifically a guide to early game shipbuilding. Uh, this is my second attempt at this guide actually. The first iteration was just a little bit rough around the edges, so I thought I'd come back today uh, with a sharper and more complete advice on how to build your first ships in what is ultimately a game with a strong space combat component. So I'm going to be covering a couple of things. Firstly, when you should build ships and why. Secondly, how you should build those ships with some advice over what you should consider specifically in the early game. And then third, I'm going to show you some of those ships in action to show you how the designs work and how you can use them to accomplish their core mission. Sound good? Let's get into it. So the first question you might ask is when should I build a ship? Because I see a lot of comments on people uh, from people both on my videos but also those of other YouTubers who say wow am I really far behind? Uh, it's, it's the late 2020s and I haven't built a ship yet I feel like I'm really really behind. Um, the f biggest mistake I think you can make with shipbuilding in Terra and Victor is building a ship before you're ready, building a ship too early. Um, ships are, of all the things you can do in space, the most expensive. They require the greatest investment of resources, and they have no economic return. They exist for military purposes or for other purposes. So they're usually the last thing that you should be building out of your initial priority set. The other thing I'll say is that the starting technology that you have to build ships... And this makes sense, right? It starts in September 2022. The starting space technology available to humanity is kind of crap. So the sort of ships that you'd be building in the early and mid-2020s would be kind of crap. Frankly, the ships you build in the 20, late 2020s, early 2030s are still crap, but you kind of need them, and they're much less crap than the ones from late 2025. So my general advice would be, the short advice would be, building your first ship in the very late 2020s, so 2028, 29, uh, or in even 30 or 31 is entirely acceptable. The long answer is you should build them once two other things are in order. Your first, this is essentially about the order in which you use your boost to set up a space economy. Terra Invicta starts as a grand strategy game on Earth, but really, Earth exists to get you off the bounds of this uh, blue-green ball and into space, generating space resources and preparing an economy that isn't constrained by Earth gravity. So the first thing you would want to do in most games is get to Luna, our moon, and set up a mining station. If there is a mining location with the right resources, you can set up a mine on Luna and that will give you the resources you need to accomplish your second goal, which is to generally colonize Mars or colonize um, asteroids in the asteroid belt or co uh, colonize Ceres, the places that are really going to give you serious resource yields that will let you support a genuine space economy. That's what you should do first with your boost before you have even considered building a warship at the stage of the game where aliens don't consider you a threat, where other factions don't have a space presence of their own, spend your boost getting mining established on the moon or on Mars, or in asteroids, or at Ceres, etc. There are more advanced strategies that involve going further out, but for a basic game, first time round, I'd stick to the inner solar system early on. The second thing you're probably going to want to do is start establishing space stations in filling up these orbital slots, particularly the low Earth orbit slots, because these are what are called interface orbits. Stations that are built in interface orbit of Earth if you look at stations that are built there, a lot of modules that you have in orbit can give bonuses to your nation on Earth. So for example, these are some tier two space science research centers. This gives every single one of these in Earth uh, interface orbit, gives a 6% bonus to all investments in mission control by any nation we control on planet Earth, up to a maximum of 30%. This can get pretty huge pretty quickly. So having a few stations in orbit to get targeted interface bonuses um, can be a good idea before you consider putting ships out. But I'd absolutely consider mines the first priority and then interface stations number two. But eventually you're going to want to build a ship. Why? And there's two reasons you would want to build a warship and then I'll cover utility ships at the end. Let's talk about warships for most of this video. The reason you would build a warship is either a faction that you don't like, so a human faction you don't like, let's just say your humanity first and they're the servants, has actually made it into space and is building ships of their own, and you want to destroy their ships and you to their space presence. That's one reason you would build a ship. But in most games, the reason you're going to build a ship is for a very specific mission. It's going to be to find, well, this is an alien fleet, Victor 70, but at the start of the game, you're probably going to see uh, destroyer-class alien vessels operating alone, running surveillance missions of Earth without an escort. Surveillance missions are very important for the aliens. 
Um, the aliens don't cheat, they're not scripted, they have their own economic system, it's quite involved, and one of the things that goes into that is abductions and surveillance missions that really helps them achieve their objectives. So stopping surveillance missions is a good idea if you can get away with it, and the second reason you want to do it is because in order to advance the story and get access to alien technology, the quickest route, the easiest route, and sometimes the onlyest route the only route, rather, is to shoot down a destroyer. So destroying one of these things, and they can generate in different ways with different weapon sets. This one's got a point defense particle beam, a missile bay, and a mag cannon, while also having a lot of Delta V and some advanced technology. Shooting down one of these is the pathway towards progressing from like the early game to what I would consider the start of the mid-game, the 2030s. You really need to shoot down one of these and get access to alien technology. So you need a warship that is capable of downing, a ship which is built using technology that is far more advanced than anything humanity can provide, that uses exotic diamondoids in its armor, that uses a fusion torch for an engine, that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Delta V, which uses magnetic accelerators for primary armament. How on earth are you going to do it? Let's go through the ship design process. You need to do two things in order to capture alien technology from a ship that you destroy. You need to have enough bang in order to kill it, and you need to have a ship which is capable of surviving the engagement. Notably, they do not have to be the same ship. So let's talk first principles, and then let's go through the, that illustrate that process with some specific designs. When building a warship, I would usually start with picking the primary uh, task that you want that ship to accomplish, and as a result, picking the right weapon. The game does allow you to choose the role of the ship. We'll cover that at the end. Sorry, I accidentally clicked out. Um, so we'll cover that at the end, but I'm talking about you, yourself, uh, and what you want a ship to accomplish, because different hulls and whatnot are going to be good for different things. So let's just say our goal is to shoot down an enemy destroyer. How are you going to do it? What is the weapon set that you're going to use? My recommendation for someone in the early game, and there are other options available, but my recommendation is that you go with missiles. As long as it's not the Tech Zero missile, the crate, which is basically just a glorified sandbox or something from planet Earth ported into space, as long as it's like a, a copperhead or a viper or a rattler, all those missiles that you get with the basic technology um, missile warfare doctrine, I might show the tech tree later, can usually do the job in large enough numbers. These are hull weapons, they're mounted on hull weapon slots. So the question is, how do you get as many missiles as possible to the fight? Because the enemy is almost always going to have at least some PD. The starting alien ship, the destroyer, it's a surveillance vessel, it's not a warship. So it's going to have some PD, but not a huge amount. It's going to have a little bit of armor, but not a huge amount. It's not a dedicated warship. So while later on missiles will start to have problems because enemies will bring more PD or more armor and be more maneuverable, and missiles also have other problems that I'll talk about in a bit, they're a good solution for shooting down a solo alien warship and likewise for shooting down early human vessels that lack enough PD of their own. You then need to pick a hull design. Realistically, at the start of the game, you will have size 1 ships. You unlock ships by their size category. Size is defined here, not just by how physically big the ship is, but by how many mission control it takes to maintain. Uh, level 1 ships, the gunship, the escort, and the corvette, take one mission control. If you unlock the next tier, frigates, monitors, and destroyers, take two. And then eventually, and you will not have these in the early game, cruisers, Battle cruisers and battleships cost three, but you're going to have tech one, uh, level one and level two to work with. And the point here is that you want to be as efficient with your mission control as possible. Using more MC is what pisses the aliens off. It's what invites retaliation. It sets the floor below which their level of hatred for you can never go down. So the less MC you're using, in that sense, the better. So what you should do is hunt for a hull type which has as many mounts as possible of the things that you want. So if we're after a missile launcher, and we could choose a Tech 1 ship between, which has no missile slots, two potential missile slots, or one potential missile slot, well then the Escort is going to be the ship for you. If you're looking at the level 2s, between the frigate with two, the destroyer with two, or the monitor with four, well, you're going to pick the monitor. 
So as I said, the purpose of the first ship is to bring enough firepower to the table to kill your opponent. Uh, so that means we're going to mount four missile bays. In this case, I'm using the Copperhead. Like I said, there are other missiles which are perfectly serviceable. The idea here is pretty simple. If the alien has one point defense weapon and you bring enough missiles, then some are going to get through. And against early game opponents like destroyers that may not have that much armor, um, and also aren't that agile in the grand scheme of things, a barrage of relatively low-tech missiles, if it is big enough, is probably going to do the job. So congratulations, you now have your primary weapon set. Now you need to make those weapons get somewhere that they can kill your opponent. It's time to talk about drives. And drives, I think, are the most complex decision to make in terms of ship design. And if I'm watching other YouTube videos um, or listening to them in the background, it's also where I see a lot of mistakes get made. So let's talk about engines. Terra Invicta has an awful lot of engines. This is a relatively small unlock pool. Right at the moment, if I went into my tech uh, tech list, I would have heaps more that I could unlock just with the technologies I have by 2032 that I've decided not to research. And by the way, one mistake that I think players make is you shouldn't try and research every engine you unlock. Generally in Terra and Victor, there are multiple lines in the tech tree. I'll do a guide on this at some point. And every line in the tech tree, so far as power and engines goes, is eventually going to give you some good engines. But they're going to give you engines that are optimized to different levels along the way. In some cases, they're going to give you low-tech engines and high-tech engines, and you might skip the low-tech ones if you're going for high-tech options. You're really rarely going to need to um, unlock I would say more than half, even more than a third of the total engines that you might hit in the tech tree if you know exactly what you're aiming for. But generally speaking, let's talk about what you're trying to balance. Let's click on an engine and have a look. The numbers you're looking for are thrust and its rating, exhaust velocity and its rating are the two primary ones. They're the biggest ones. And then to a lesser extent, what fuel does it use and how much power does it take? So what do all these numbers mean? Uh, thrust is just the amount of energy that the thing can put out per unit time. Um, how fast can it make your ship go? How fast can you do 0 to 60? How quickly can you accelerate? Ships with lots of thrust are nimble. They get places quickly. In combat, they might be able to dodge certain projectiles more easily, or they can control the range of the engagement. There's lots of flexibility to be earned by having lots of thrust. Exhaust velocity determines how much efficiency, essentially, you get out of your propellant. How quickly are you expelling whatever it is you're throwing out the back? If thrust is how quickly you can throw it out in terms of how much volume you can dispose of per unit time, exhaust velocity is how much you can accelerate that propellant to make the ship go further per unit of fuel. In other words, one is your acceleration potential and one has a very big impact on your range slash how much you can fire the engine. A ship with very, very low um very, 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 very high thrust and low exhaust velocity is basically the candle that burns bright, um, burning out fastest. So, in terms of engines, you're looking at the trade-off between those two values. How quick do you want your ship to be and how much range slash burn time do you want it to have? Propellant, um, some engines can be really, really good, but they can use, for example, rare materials, noble metals as propellant, or they can use fissile materials as propellant. Um, there is the Orion Drive nuclear pulse engine. It's a very high-performing engine. It involves dropping nukes behind your vessel and detonating them against the giant shield to throw your vessel forward. That's a really powerful, really capable engine that you can get pretty early in the game, but it uses fissile materials as its power source. Other engines use water, so hydrogen, or volatile materials. Um, so weighing up all those factors is important. So to illustrate one of the big mistakes I've seen a number of people make is they get attracted to uh, ion drives. So grid drives, hull drives, um, these are electric engines that use, that have, offer very, 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 very high exhaust velocities, but they have very low thrust ratings. What does that mean in practice? Well, Here's what, here's what tends to happen. You add an engine and then you add propellant tanks. Each tank adds 100 tons of whatever propellant you happen to use. The need for propellant and engines, by the way, is the reason ships are expensive and space stations are cheap. Um, there's a lot of weight in propellant in a lot of these things. So every time I add propellant, I'm adding weight, which means I'm slowing the ship down, but I'm also adding cruise delta V. 
Um, these numbers here, cruise acceleration, combat acceleration, cruise delta V, are all products of the engine and how much propellant you have and how, uh, and how heavy your ship is. Cruise acceleration is how fast you accelerate in strategic movement. Combat acceleration is the maximum acceleration, so change of velocity you can manage in combat. And cruise delta V is essentially your total range. It's how much you can change your velocity um, with an entire fuel tank, whether that be speeding up or slowing down. To give you rough numbers, five is enough to get from Earth to the moon most of the time. 10 will get you from Earth to Mars, Under uh, although you might want to have a little bit more, um, depending on which Earth orbit and Mars orbit you are dealing with. So 40 here is actually a lot. Once you, uh, Alien ships might have 600, 700, 800, 900, of which they might use 400, burning from the outer system all the way to Earth on a relatively fast trajectory. But 40 here is dramatic. Remember your first ship, however, is going to be shooting down something that's around Earth. It's probably not going to be going to other planets. So I would safely aim for something that has like somewhere between 6 and 10 Delta V. You can possibly get away with even less. But people really like seeing large cruise Delta V numbers. Uh, so something like an ion drive seems like a great idea. So you go up to eight thrusters. Um, usually you would go up to the maximum number of thrusters that you can afford to power. Um, I'll talk about power plants when I get there, don't worry. So you had the maximum number of thrusters, you had some propellant tanks, and you're like, hooray, this ship has 30.7 cruise delta V. The problem with these long-range, very efficient engines um, that use uh, an accelerated field and uh, electric field and accelerate like, um, I think it's xenon that's used in these engines. Anyway, um, it uses a mixture of water and metals in game, is that they're very, 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 very slow. This thing has a thrust uh, of 8,664 newtons, a rating of 4.1, which means this thing has a combat acceleration of 13 milli-Gs. This thing will crawl. If you see someone having 25 weak transfer times in around between Earth orbits, they're probably mounting a really efficient electric drive. These things exist not to power warships, but to power light exploration and colonization ships that are going way out into the outer solar system. Um, humanity in our current timeline thinks about using these things for probes, not for warships. What you want instead is something with a little bit more kick. And you have two options. If we compare at the start of the game, you might think it's stupid, but if you look at some of the... Um, if you look at some of the liquid motors that you have available to you at the start of the game, just basic bitch liquid rocket engines, um, these things have insane thrust. This thing yields 47 million newtons of thrust with a rating of 16.5. You uh, slap 10 propellant tanks on this thing, it's got a cruise and combat acceleration of 2.3 Gs, not milli Gs, Gs and there's a thousand milli G's in a G. It is orders of magnitude more powerful than the ion drive. Uh, this ship, when it fires that motor, it's not going to burn very long, but the ship is going to get up and go, okay? Um, now, usually rocket engines will not have enough delta V, but there are circumstances where you can make this sort of engine work, depending on the weight of the rest of the ship. And with these sort of accelerations, you will pull maneuvers, especially if you're talking about a small, say, an escort, an escort powered by a Nova Liquid rocket with six batteries. This thing's got combat acceleration that is better. This thing has a combat acceleration of four Gs. That will massively outperform alien vessels with their fusion torch engines. And it's just a simple rocket motor. And that's because setting fire to a bunch of react reactive mass, um, like oxidizer and fuel, is actually a great way to generate a crap ton of energy really, really quickly. It's low tech, but it's great, but the engine burns out. So you'll never go reliably to like Mars with these engines, but for orbital defense work, entirely serviceable. Other options are to go into the nuclear drive category um, or nuclear pulse drives. So the Nerva is an example of an early nuclear rocket engine. This thing uses a nuclear power plant connected to it. Uh, Ordinary rocket engines don't require electricity, nuclear engines do, and these things get much more efficiency but much lower thrust than their solid rocket equivalents. So this thing, for example, has twice the, uh, twice the range, more than twice the range, and can scale more. 
but the combat acceleration is much reduced. So 700 milli-Gs at this configuration, for example, it's okay, as is the cruise acceleration. It's not going to get up and go the way a chemical rocket is, um, but it is going to give you more range, which means you can burn longer in combat or you can have more flexibility in how you use your vessel. Up to you. The Nerva is a good early option. More advanced urgent, uh, nuclear drives could, for example, include the Pulsar drive, this is one that I tend to have by the time I engage the enemy for the first time. You may even be able to get to advanced pulsars before you uh, fight your first battle. And if you do that, you'll find that you've got combat acceleration of 4 Gs, so same as a, a rocket motor, and your cruise delta V is now 20.7 and can go higher um, instead of what it was before with the rocket motor, which was like 4 or something. But the pulsar is a great engine once you have it. This is this is perfectly functional. It works perfectly fine on heavier ships like monitors as well. These are engines that are going to get you where you need to go, that are going to give you a reasonable amount of KPS. You don't need more than this for orbital defense work, which is all you propose to use them for. Um, and I think they represent a good compromise between the early rocket motors and later on. But it can be funny to go into space with early rocket motors and make them work. It's just keep in mind that if you burn all your fuel in combat, and don't have enough to return to a station to refuel, then you're just going to die in the cold depth of space. So those are engines. Make the choice of engine based on what you're trying to do, and if you're building an early game warship that's going to fight in Earth orbit, or in Mercury orbit, or Mars orbit, don't go building 500, or don't even go building 50 cruise Delta V, and instead look at your cruise and combat acceleration. Cruise acceleration means you can actually make intercepts before alien vessels do their mission and fly away. Combat acceleration means that you're capable of doing anything other than just pointing your nose at the enemy uh, and proceeding, which admittedly is sometimes the right thing. So let's just say we picked an engine, we picked the pulsar drive, uh, we picked the weapons, we're mounting four tubes of missiles. Uh, we'll choose a role for the ship. This describes the AI. Uh, so for example, uh, what's a, we'll pick standoff for this one. Uh, suggesting that it prefer prefers a long engagement range. I actually like... I actually like this, but it, this is only if you're going to let the AI control your vessels, but this because it puts it near the PD vessels, or you can give it a mode that puts it further back. So we have a primary weapon, we have a primary drive. What do we need next? Um, so next we need armor plate. You start with a number of armors unlocked, primarily things like steel and I think titanium you start with. The difference between different armors is they have different bonuses to things like uh, chipping or versus kinetic or versus energy weapons. So they're good at different things. They cost different materials. So steel is super, super cheap, and but it is massively heavy, but it's also made out of just steel and volatiles. Titanium is better than steel in almost every way. Um, it's lighter and it's still resistant to chipping, significant weight saving, but it's made out of um, much more valuable material, silicon carbide, and then you've got boron carbide, and the first armors that you really want to consider using. If you have to go to war um, with steel, I would seriously consider not armoring a vessel and relying on a survivor vessel. We'll talk about that later, but um, things like uh, nano armor and adamantane armor that you get early on, are useful because they massively reduce the amount of weight that is involved in armoring your ship. Well, how should I armor my ship? Well, if you look at the armor points here, you'll, the key items are weight. It's 21.1 tons per nose or tail armor, 263.8 for lateral armor, because the side of the ship is a much larger surface area than the front. So, one mistake I see people see is you slap like 10 armor on the side and all of a sudden this ship can't go anywhere. It's got 2.7 cruise delta V. It's it's um, accelerations in the absolute toilet. The solution I have found works well, especially in the early game, and especially if you're willing to do some flying or use the padlock tool, is to armor the front primarily, and maybe slap a point or two on the side. But if you can't afford it early on, then don't. If you're still using nerve engines, then just rely on only taking hits on the front quarter. Um, armor values of like 10 to 20. We'll get you'll you'll see that you get results out of them. Um, if you're using a lighter ship, something like 17.3 uh, or 17.4 on a smaller vessel is possible. Again, depending on the engine, as long as you've got lighter armor unlocked. But uh, yeah, make like the Imperium of Man. Armor the prow first, and then if you can afford armor for the sides, do that later. 
you then need a battery. This is particularly important if you're using energy weapons, um, but a ship cannot be built without them. You'll see the trade-offs here range from how heavy it is, what it's made out of, um, and what capacity the battery has. In this case, I've got the Tesla batteries, the lithium ions, lithium sulfurs, and quantums. Quantum is by far the best in that it's got 80 gigajoules of energy, but it's also heavier. So for this one, I could literally just stick the, lithium, the lighter lithium sulfur battery on it and be fine. We then need a radiator to deal with heat. The trade-offs with radiators, okay, you start with, I think, aluminium fin and titanium. The trade-offs to look at are how heavy are they per waste heat that they dump and how vulnerable are they when deployed and to a limited extent, how much do they cost and what material do they use. You need radiators in space. Um, you're not touching air, you're not touching water, you can't convey heat in that way. So ships get hot, they generate heat, whether from their reactors or their engines or their energy weapons or whatnot. Uh, they need a way to dump it, and the radiator is how they dump their heat. So in this case, I could, um, at the start of the game, I could pay valuable materials to save a lot of weight in order to use a titanium radiator, or I could be a cheap ass and have a heavier aluminium fin radiator. Luckily for me, I've unlocked uh, nanotube filament radiators, which are lighter again, but don't use super valuable materials, so there we go. And then we're into utility modules. This ship is functional. It, you, you can fly it now. It doesn't need utility mo uh, modules. Everything it needs is now in place. Um, but there are some utility modules you might want to add. For example, heat sinks here. If ships generate waste heat, but you've pulled your um, radiators in to avoid them getting shot off in combat, that's a button that you can press and usually should press. And if you give it the AI control, it will always do that in combat unless it's overheating. Uh, the ship needs to put heat somewhere and preferably that somewhere is not the bodies of the crew or like the missiles in their launch tubes. So you want a heat sink. Of all the ones I've got here, the lithium one is by far the lightest while also having lots of capacity, so I'll add it. I don't have a lot of heat generation on this ship, so I don't need the super heavy versions. Then there's other utility modules available. So for example, I could put electronic countermeasures on this ship to give it a little bit of protection against missiles, but I'm gonna double stack magazines. Magazines help solve, well not solve, they partially patch one of the problems of the missile. Missile weapons um, biggest weakness outside of defensive operations is that they don't carry much ammo. Uh, the Copperhead carries 10 missiles, it fires two every five seconds. Uh, which means in 25 seconds you will have emptied your entire salvo of missiles. This means in your average engagement, you'll fire your entire ammo load. So if you're operating away from your base and you fire your entire ammo load, it only takes one alien ship with way more Delta V than you because of their advanced technology to come and literally destroy your entire fleet. Each magazine gives a full additional reload. So each of these is worth 40 additional missiles because it's giving an additional 10 to each one. And there we are. That is a design complete. This is basically what I would call the Western Australia class in my playthrough. You would have seen it then. Um, that version does eventually, however, have an advanced pulsar, which brings the performance characteristics up and in return is able to add some armor to the side and up the front a little bit more. And I think I had about seven KPS on it. There we go. Um, alternatively, you can easily build as your missile platform. Uh, again, we'll use the pulsar, a couple, throw, throw a couple of propellant tanks on there. In fact, I can just see the existing design. Uh, where's the wallaby? Here we are. This is a wallaby. It's a missile delivery platform. Uh, the advantage here is you have two ships instead of one, so it's harder to destroy both. Um, and it's got a little bit more protection and a little bit more acceleration per unit mass. Um, because there's more of them, they're a little bit harder to cover with point defense uh, ships, and you're more likely to... Oh, and it takes slightly more shipyard time to build. Um, and I think overall the costs are indeed higher on net building two escorts as opposed to one monitor. But in terms of missile platforms, both of these designs work perfectly well. And this is where I stopped my last ship design video while missing the obvious. You need a ship to destroy the enemy, but you also need a ship to survive the battle. With four missile sets of missile tubes, or even eight if you bring two of those ships, the enemy will happily engage you because you'll look like you have less combat power than them. They'll come to you and then you'll blow them up with your missiles. The problem is if they kill you too, with missiles or weapons that they launch before they're destroyed, 
you don't win the battle, it's a draw, and you don't get to keep their technology, so you need instead ships that are designed to survive. So let me introduce you to something like the New Zealand class monitor. So this is a ship which it places all of its emphasis instead on survival. We're going to refit this as we do so in order to demonstrate the concept. So what have we done here? We're still using a monitor design, we're still using the same sort of engine. Um, I'll just kick that up and kick that up a notch. But this thing has lots of armor. Uh, and this one needs it. You can afford to cut the armor on your missile ships if you need to, or your offensive ships if you need to. But on the survivor ship, absolutely pump that armor as far as it'll go, and maybe even have some armor on the side. Then we've pulled all the magazines off and we've replaced it one with a, an ECM module. This will detonate about 20% of incoming missiles before they arrive. And then the other thing that needs to change is the hull weapons. You want as much point defense as possible. So originally you'll get point defense lasers, they're pretty weak, much more effective than point defense lasers if you can get them in time, are things like point defense particle beams. These are weapons that are designed to shoot it down incoming projectiles. And the idea of a survivor vessel, they can be used in two ways. They can either be put in front of your killer vessel in order to try and screen it, shooting down incoming missiles and ordnance, and then try and survive the battle themselves, or they can scatter and then try and get away from the enemy so that by the time that they are later on engaged um, they are capable of defending themselves from whatever is left long enough for the missiles to arrive. The good thing about these survivor ships is that they don't have very much combat value. They have very low combat value. So the aliens don't value them particularly highly, which means you can put more of them in a fleet before the aliens are like, nah, that, that human fleet looks a bit scary, I'm not going to engage that. Um, two of these ships in a fleet, aliens really won't care. Even if you have the better version equipped with um, particle defense cannons, uh, particle beams rather, it's still only 84. So you can have a couple of these survivor ships. You could easily put two New Zealands or three New Zealands into a battle without anyone worrying about it. Uh, similarly, you can have the uh, the upgraded version is the Otoroa. Uh, what's a good example of a small frigate? South Island class. Okay, so this is the South Island class. This is the same thing done on an escort chassis with a Nerva drive for demonstration. Um, if you look at it with the advanced pulsar, you'll see that its performance characteristics are quite good. This thing's got 20 forward armor with the better engine. It could easily have like seven side armor and like 25 or even 30 front armor and still have entirely um, acceptable cruise and combat acceleration while still having two forward point defenses and it's got a relatively low combat value. So again, these ships take a lot of effort to destroy, like a lot of effort to destroy, relative to their cost, but do absolutely no damage to the enemy. They're not carrying missile tubes or magazines, they're only there to survive and screen the other ships. These two classes of vessel working together are capable of destroying small enemy forces. Ideally, they're designed for taking down lone enemy destroyers, maybe a pair of destroyers if you're operating a big enough fleet and you use them wisely. We'll get on to using them wisely in a moment. I'll show off some of these ships in battle. A final note before we leave the ship design screen, a quick note on designing vessels for other purposes. There are two other purposes that you might want early in the game. Uh, they are colony ships and marine transports. Colony ships use this utility module. I just want a gunship. Use this utility module here, these outpost kits. The reason you want these, and I previously said you can use them without the technology to go to a planet. That's not true. What these, what these allow you to do is fly a ship to a planet or a body and instantly or very quickly set up an outpost with um, a power generator and a construction module, which can then build other, loca other stations at that location. This can be really good because boosting platforms from Earth can take a very, very, very long time relative to how quick it takes a ship to get there. So if I put a fission outpost ship um, kit on this vessel, I might be able to build a ship which can fly to um, a particular, let's just say Jupiter or something. I might be able to build one that can get there in 20 weeks, whereas sending something from Earth might take a year and a half. I'm making those numbers up, but those are the rough ratios you might look at. So if you want to be first to get there, as soon as Mission to Jupiter fires, you want one of these colony ships ready to go, and you're going to launch that straight at one of uh, Jupiter's moons and set up a base there. 
the key here is that you need enough range to get there. So you click choose example transfer. We'll select origin around Earth so you can pick what station you're launching from. I'm going to assume that I'd be launching from extreme Earth orbit because you want to put one station in extreme Earth orbit just to save efficiency. Even if it's just a ship, uh, a station which can refuel you. If you're launching your ships from low Earth orbit, you can refuel in extreme before you leave. Um, that's fine. Then we want to uh, choose a destination. So we'll pick Jupiter. I want to fly to Europa. And I want to reach high Europa orbit. Fantastic. Um, we can then put in our acceleration and our whatnot for our ship, and we can plan appropriately. So let's stick an engine on it. This is where something like an ion drive might come in handy. We'll add armor technically, but we won't add any armor value. We won't add any weapons. The key here is the absolute minimum weight possible. So we'll put the cheapest, lightest battery possible on the thing. We'll add the lightest possible radiator. What does it still need? Da, 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 battery armor, oh, propellant tanks, duh, okay. So we'll add, we'll add some propellant tanks. And you can see here, I've now got my transfer mapped. And this will let you find the ideal balance. Because if you don't have enough delta V, the ship's going to have to take an inefficient transfer path, which ends up taking longer than making the ship heavier, but giving it more delta V to burn for longer. Makes sense. Um, you need to do more transfers and waiting for optimal transfer windows. The game is a hard sci-fi game, so orbital paths matter. So in this case, we would know that this ship that we are building could make it there. Um, what else are we missing? I miss, oh, I'm missing an uh, power plant. Bang. All right. So you would then pick your ideal balance of propellant with maybe a little bit extra for courtesy, just for protection. And this would be your colony ship. And you could play around with engines and motors to make it, but this one could do the trip in less than a year. Launching a platform from Earth normally would not do it. We'll just experiment for a moment, see if we can do it with the advanced pulsar drive. And you'll see, I can't make a ship with an advanced pulsar that will make the trip as quickly unless I'm willing to go up to so many propellant tanks that it can do a really efficient direct um, semi-direct transfer and that would cost me 700 water worth of propellant it's much more efficient in this case to just grab that ion drive and take the bare minimum propellant and hit that lovely target point of about 55 weeks so there you are that's a basic colony ship and this thing once it creates the platform the platform can create a shipyard and the shipyard can refuel the vessel and give it another outpost kit and from there it can fly to whatever its next target is um, the key here cheap small is better um, don't try and over engineer the thing this is not kerbal space program you don't need 600 rocket boosters to get to to get to mars uh, cheap and cheerful is the go especially in mc the final uh, sort of vessel you might want early is a marine transport and here again um, you want something with as many utility slots as possible to carry as many marine assault units as possible these ships are designed to go take other people's stations and bases away from them so to that end you don't need any offensive weapons if you want to mount some point defense you can just to give it a little bit of combat value but ideally if these things get attacked then you'll die um, <laughs> just from an efficiency perspective engineering them to be worthwhile in combat is probably not worth it you don't want to be risking them if you want to risk them design one bring a full weapon complement but be aware you might lose your marines then again cheap and cheerful is good slap an engine on it and here it's about what matters to you. Uh, is range important? Is strategic acceleration important? How much range do you need? With this one, uh, I can get 15.4 kps. I might even go up to 20 kps out of this thing, but still have a decent cruise acceleration value. I can increase the cruise acceleration value by about 20% in exchange for a quarter of its range. May or may not do that. Again, um, unless you're going to be assaulting a station that is defended and you're not in the early game, Early game versions can mount zero armor and be done with it. There you are. That's a perfectly functional marine transport. 
Between those three sorts of ships, uh, colony ships, marine transports, a killer ship, and a survivor ship, you should be set for early game space combat. You can take on individual lone alien vessels, you're not using too much MC, you can be first to reach uh, new planets when the tech fires, so if you're the first person to pop uh, mission to Jupiter fires, well you can get there before the AI because your colony ship is already on the way. Uh, even before the probes arrive, the prospecting probes, your ship can be in, um, arriving relatively soon afterwards, creating a platform, and you'll win the race for colonization, essentially. Awesome. So those are three vessels. It's a brief talk about engines, armor, generators, and how they all weigh up. Uh, one extra note about generators. At the start, you only have fuel cells. You don't have any nuclear reactors. These are really only good for ordinary rocket motors because these don't require any fuel uh, sorry don't require any energy because the energy comes from just you know lighting the stuff in the tank on fire uh, that doesn't require a whole bunch of electricity so the fuel cell doesn't really need to do much um, fuel cells however will have a really really bad time if you're trying to power a bunch of laser systems so as soon as possible, I would move over to solid or gas core fission engines, and later on there are all sorts of weird and wonderful power plants. So that's a discussion of ships, a couple of problems with them, uh, common mistakes, uh, the biggest one being fitting electric engines with very, very, very low acceleration and then wondering why your ships take 25 weeks to change orbit. Um, let's go look at some combat into how you use these things to actually shoot down some aliens and get their technology and advance the story if you're one of those factions that needs to do so. I also thought I'd do some brief commentary on weapons to make sure that you think I'm not in the missile fan club for no reason, or that I'm saying the rest of the tech tree is useless. I'm not. I'm just saying that I think missiles are the best weapon, usually, to take down your first enemy warship, uh, because they tend to hit side armor, because they can be fired at long range, because they can hit the target and continue doing damage long after the ship that fired them is destroyed. There's a whole bunch of reasons that missiles are very, very good early on. And most of it comes down to the fact that their weaknesses of you know limited ammo count and whatnot don't matter when you're on the defense, when you can easily reload. Uh, kinetics, by con uh, contrast, this gives you railguns. Railguns, uh, it's hard to hit anyone with them in the early game. Uh, and that's because the velocity, the movement speed of the projectiles from early game railguns is pretty low. Um, it's the same reason that the 10 and 12 inch guns that you get at the start of the game suck. They're terrible. And it's because the rounds move so slowly through space that the alien is going to have time to evade because the round just doesn't arrive quickly enough. But missiles can't be used for orbital bombardment and railguns can. So if you go down this tech or pick it up after you've picked up missiles, you can build bombardment ships that are capable of firing their weapons at Earth. That's kind of cool. Directed energy warfare doctrine takes you towards things like particle cannons and lasers. Now, lasers have difficulties at long range and with lots of armor. They do less damage than, for example, a missile impact, and they attenuate at range. They get weaker at range. So if you're shooting a laser into the front armor and there's 20 front armor on the alien vessel, you're going to have a hard time getting through. But at the same time, you are going to hit. They always hit. They hit instantly. Um, they have long ranges. They have secondary roles in point defense. So a lot of the good point defense weapons are in energy warfare doctrine. Particle cannons give you point defense particle beams. Infrared combat lasers give you lasers that can be used against enemy ships, but can be toggled and fired against incoming missiles as well. They're not as good at it as other weapons, like dedicated PD but they can be used in that role in an emergency. If you have an oh shit moment and ship's about to die, slap all those um, lasers onto defense mode and hope for the best. So there is something to be found in all of these weapon techs and the same holds true later on. I like missiles. Missiles will kill your first destroyer, but there is a purpose to all of these. And once you head outside away from your supply bases, you'll be pretty happy to have an infinite supply of ammunition or a very large supply of ammunition versus having a limited stockpile that you have to husband. Just a thought. All right, so we're in skirmish mode for a couple of demonstrations now of ways you can make this work. I paired a Western Australia class monitor, which is the four copper head mount monitor uh, with a point defense escort, which is mounting two point defense particle beams. 
Uh, I've also done this using monitors with four defense lasers if you want something a little bit lower tech, or you could use two escorts with uh, laser defenses. There are different options. This just illustrates the concept. Suffice to say, uh, we have a lot less combat power on our side than the enemy does with this destroyer, so the AI would choose to fight us. It wouldn't run away. The way you're going to do this battle normally is you're going to priority target this button, this button, and that's going to tell uh, your monitor to start firing missiles at this guy as soon as the battle begins. You're also going to tell everyone to pull in their radiators because there's no need to have them out. And then all I'm going to do with the escort is take this maneuver node and I'm going to burn forward and towards my ship just a bit just to get them a little bit closer together and to uh, interpose my escort vessel. Uh, with my monitor. Meanwhile, the monitor, I'm going to hit the padlock button. That's going to mean he keeps his nose, which is the most armored part of the ship, pointed right at that destroyer. I didn't check if that destroyer has long range lasers or not, so I'm not going to take any chances. As soon as the escort has made the burn, like this, that will eventually put him in front, I'm going to get him and I'm going to hit padlock on him too. So as soon as he hits this maneuver node, he's going to point himself at that destroyer which means that if it has any long-range weapons, it's going to hit... There he is! So there's the laser, and it hits the front nose armor, which the escort can tank. Lasers don't have lots of accuracy and long-range, but they don't uh, do as much damage against armor at a distance. So our missiles are in the air. They're almost arriving. You can see the PD is not enough to keep up with four tubes at once. PD is now firing against these probably magnetic projectiles. Next missiles are arriving. Okay, the Crescent Moon, that, that destroyer is basically done. Okay, the destroyer is now destroyed. Job done. Now, the uh, my shield ship is damaged. It's taken a lot of forward damage. Uh, there's some damage to its fission reactor. So it's basically drifting. It's not in great shape, but the monitor is completely unharmed. And just in case you thought this was a fluke, I'll reset this with lower tech ve uh, vessel ships that have the same combat value. There's just more of them. Um, just so you think I'm not cheating by using uh, particle point defenses, even though that's a pretty cheap, relatively early tech too. So now we're using three ships, uh, but they have even, I think they have even less combat power than the previous set. Here we're using a couple of NZ classes, which have three point defense lasers and one missile tube, um, and one Western Australia class with four copperhead bays. We're just going to priority target. We're going to burn the two defensive ships inwards and ahead, just give them a little bit of an advantage. We're going to padlock the missile ship. And we're going to run, uh, pull in radiators and run time. So all missile tubes should fire pretty early on. This put this this um, configuration puts even more missiles in the air than before. Now we're going to padlock the escort ships. He should start engaging me now. Now laser PD is going to do a much less impressive job, but I've got more hulls and just about as much armor in the air at the same time. Now at this stage. What you can see is padlock's probably not going to do the right job. Now, if you want to micromanage at this point, you need to take this guy off padlock, take uh, an upcoming burn, and angle towards. But, you know, I think he's probably doomed anyway. There's too many rounds in the air, so he's not going to be able to do it. If I'd seen that earlier, um, I would have been able to manipulate this node, and I could probably have controlled that node, uh, node to point the nose at the enemy. Instead, this is going to hit his side armor, and he's probably done. Too bad, so sad. But there are so many missiles in the air at this point that I think our enemy is basically done. So I'm going to take slow-mo off. Speed time up. We're about to lose one ship. Actually, no, the PD was doing an okay job. Laser PD is very short range, though, so Illustrious isn't really going to be able to support Indefatigable. Get the nose around, get the nose around. Nice, nice, fantastic. Maneuver end up working in the end, and the nose gets around the front. Lasers do the intercepts. No damage done, even less combat power than before. Um, I won't show a version of this where you use frigates. It's possible to use frigates. Um, frigates don't use any PD. Instead, you bring a lot of them. They each have tubes, and then the gamble is you instead starburst them in all different directions so the aliens can't, in can't hit all of them, and you lose some, but you end up winning the battle. 
So there we are, those are two engagements against an alien destroyer using relatively early game ships. Um, auto control works if you bring enough vessels, but it tends to end up pointing the side armor at your opponent and getting your ships killed, so I tend to stay away from it. In any case, I hope those illustrated examples are some really simple techniques and tactics that you can use to kill your first enemy vessel. I hope those were helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments. Um, and I also hope that this one was a little higher quality in terms of what it covered than the previous iteration. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope you're all enjoying the game and enjoying the Humanity First playthrough series. I'll see you all again soon.